Hi everybody, me and Amy back. Hello my darling Amy. Hello my darling Karen. Well that was quite complicated wasn't it doing that bit of research. Um, I, came in, I, I came into this really because when I was doing it about the fleeing to America and I heard this video they were talking about the famine came in, there was this great big mist, mist or fog and then um, basically millions of them went off to America. But it is really strange just to explain right. You, I don't know if any country is cold, but when you get this really cold air, now imagine a fog over you for three days. So basically, this fog came in over the potatoes, and then it was there for three days, and when the fog went, where the fog had been over the top of the crops, obviously maybe not so much if it is in the leaves, but basically it just killed all the tops of the plants off. And so that's what started the potato famine. How can that be something that's a disease when that happened? That's right. I mean, when you listen to it that way, it sounds like some energy weapon came in. It lasted for three days and it, it killed all the crops. It could have been a natural one, but this fog came in. It was, it must have been over the whole of Ireland then. And then it killed the crops. I don't know what they're going on about with the, with the potato famine and it's a disease and all that because it was a fog that caused it. But it started, as we were listening earlier on, Amy, in the 1930s, but they're talking about it as the 1940s into the 50s. It's like 10 years, and that's what caused, and they just didn't recover from it, and it just kept killing, and you know, the crops just kept getting more and more diseased. But yes. then, at the same time, this radio show we're going to listen to, it basically says that um, the people, it was a, it was a holocaust, and what yes. was happening was that they were exporting all this food on the ferries, all this food, it's in the video, I whizzed through it but you can stop it, it's tons and tons of this and tons and tons of that and tons of this and tons of that. So they're starving the people, the people are not allowed to eat anything yet they're exporting tons of flour and goods. Oh, we're just going to stop here one second Amy before you say anything. Okay. This went in the paper, it says Saturday. September the 13th, 1845. Meetings for two following weeks, Wednesday, September the 17th, South London, um, Floricultural, I think it says 1pm. County shows, Wednesday the 17th, Friday the 19th, and September the 25th. Thursday, Septem September the 25th. We stopped the press, we very much, we very great regret to announce that the potato murin or murin yeah, m u w r, -R a i n has unevocably uh, declared itself in ireland the crops about dublin are suddenly perishing conversion potatoes into flour by the process described by mr babington and others in today's paper become then a process of the first national importance for where i where Ireland be in the event of the universal potato rot. So it's rotting the potatoes. But in it, Amy, I'm going to let Amy talk in just a minute because these are the things, right? Um, so basically, um, they, in, in, in um, the early 1800s, they did a census where there was 8.2 million people in Ireland. And I'm thinking, there's probably only about that many people there now. Right. Maybe there's less, maybe there's more, but I don't think it's suddenly like doubled and trebled. Anyway, right. the numbers I mean. And then it talks yeah. about millions died and then three million basically moved to America. And when you did all that, like suddenly Ireland had lost at least half of its population through the death of this, this disease and then um, migrating to America. Yes. I, I just think that's incredible, don't you? I do too, Karen. And then we listened to uh, one person say that the trip to our, to America was so bad they called the ships coffin ships because people, so many people were dying on it. Oh, yes. And then it said also in there that they were producing the lumper potato and eating that. Um, I just think it's incredible to how much they're exporting. So they're actually starving the people to death but they're producing all these goods. Why, and then they, why didn't they use some of the crop? I mean, you know, if you were starving to death and you would, you'd say, no, I'd nick some flour so we can have some bread. Whatever it is, yeah. 
you know, even if it's just a little bit like, so they're making all this crop and then they're exporting it at the same time they're being starved to death. That's right. I came on to talk about the fog really, that the fog landed and it killed the crop. Everywhere you go, it's all about what it did to the potato, diseased it, and then every year they grew it, it was diseased and diseased and diseased and diseased. They got another crop to come in, maize or something, but they they basically lost their whole of everything because it was their food, their, their uh, how they earned their money. Uh, it just I'm I'm just a bit shocked. So they've been making all this stuff to export and being starved to death at the same time. I don't think it adds up, Amy. I know, Karen. Um, you think um, that it's true, or do you think that? Um, I don't know because <laughs> the mist coming in and killing the crop is not a disease. That's a mist right. coming in and killing the crop. Exactly. But after that, yeah. I, d I don't know. It sounds like oh, they just. Here we go. It says on the computer right now genocide, the deliberate killing of a large group of people, especially those of a particular nation or ethnic group. Yes, sounds like that's what they were trying to do with the Irish people. Right, this is a bit of the paperwork, right? So in here it says, The famine began quite mysteriously in September 1845, as leaves on the potato plant suddenly turned black and curled and then rotted, seemingly the result of a fog that had wafted across the fields of Ireland. The cause was actually an airborne fungus, uh, whatever that's called, originally transported in its hordes off ships travelling through North America to England. What? So a fog came yeah. in, but actually no, it's to do with an airborne fungus. Yeah. Um, how can it turn from a fog into an airborne fungus? I'm a bit sort of shocked. Um, it sounds like some kind of weapon, maybe, like a... Maybe this is when the star... I'm going to sneeze again. <coughs> oh, I might leave that one in. <laughs> um, maybe this is when the star forts were ruined or they used the star forts. It's not like they talk about the star forts. Oh, look, we're planting next to the star fort or anything like that, is it? Oh, another one now. Hang on, Amy. Another one. So in here again, it talks about the fog. So it goes Irish farmers told of the plight striking overnight leaving blackened leaves and a gooey in uh, whatever that is inedible tuber and a powerful stench what overnight that does sound like an ed yeah. weapon doesn't it a mist row up over the a mist row up over the sea remembered one farmer and you could hear a voice talking near a mile off across the stillness of the air it was the same for three days or more and then when the fog lifted you could give, begin to see the tops of the potato stalks lying over as if life had gone out of them but the fog came in killed the crop but after that it didn't cause all the other problems with the potato so maybe this is what attracted me to this but maybe it was a do you believe it was a fungus amy mm -mm, i don't think it was really a fungus i think it was more of something to do with that mist unless the mist was contained some kind of a uh, airborne fungus, like they said, sort of like a biological weapon type thing. Yeah, perhaps. me too. That's what I thought. But then, yeah. but this this dying of the crops was happening before 1845, and it went on for quite a few more years. So it couldn't have just been the mist. But to me, I right. thought it was the mist. But then, I know. but then they're they're exporting all this stuff. How can they have? been being starved if they're making all the tons and tons of food for the English. Yeah, it sounds like they wanted the people to have to uh, go to America uh, trying to tell them they were starving, but they really shouldn't have had been starved if they could export all of that food. So, yeah, it just doesn't add up. Um, I don't know if they were just trying to have genocide or just treat them like slaves or what they were doing. Sort of, um, Maybe they were the Black Moors. That could be. Yeah. That's a good point too. Because Maybe they were just we trying might... to get rid of a race of people. No, you don't yeah. live here. We live here. I don't know, but all those graves, it sounds like they were killing families. Yeah, that's was awful. So what, they were doing that for 10, 15 years? Because that's how long the potato famine actually lasted, the whole thing. 
Yes. Well, 55 to 30, so that's 25 years. Right. Amy, I thought it was bad enough a fog had come in and killed the crop and caused all this, but then you realise it went on for 10, 15, 20 years. Like, well, I, know. I don't know where to put it now, and then all the food going off to um, America. I, I, I don't get that. You know, if you're starving the people to death so they can... I mean, there's a picture here of this immigration and she looks very sorrowful and she's got a white face, by the way. So this person here was probably a coloured person. See, by the colour of their hands? And they've covered over... them. They've covered over... Let's go back again. They've covered over... They've covered her over by giving her a white face and you just think she looks ill, but she's actually a dark person, probably, like the ones behind. Again, the same thing. That's probably what it's to do with, if anything... Let's stick yes. some white English people over there. But I just can't get over how many people were going off to America. And then when they got there, they were still slaves, put into quarantine, and their children taken off of them. Right. Seems like they had an agenda to do that, get people to America, and then take their children. That's, that's, what, that's what we saw, because what it was is it was me and James doing it. We looked at the buildings. There were so many great big buildings. If we've just moved to America, how come there's all these great big like hospital complexes or maybe they were asylums or they're just big buildings with lots of land and um, right. basically um, we just said oh look they could have put the people in there and then it but it that and then we found other people talking about the same thing so once you work it out for yourself what's happened then other people you find other people talking about the fact that they were quarantined and their children were taken off of them yes. It's very horrible, and I don't know why they want to do that. And then you find out but that um, Hitler did the same thing. Exactly. That was one of his jobs, yeah. apart from taking down the Tartaria buildings, bombing things, you know, pretending, um, and um, taking the children. Right. Yeah, they had some really sinister agendas. And oh no, I'm just a bit gobsmacked like with it all. <laughs> Do you know the one thing I just want? One thing I just want to have a look up, Amy. I'll see if we can find it. If we can't, the video um, will carry on. But they talked about what was it? They talked about Black Forty Seven. I'm just going to go and look that up, Amy. Okay. So Amy found this bit of information, didn't you, Amy, about Black Forty Seven? Yes, it says uh, the worst year of the period was 1847, known as Black 47. During the famine, about one million people died and one million more left the country, causing the country's population to fall by 20% to 25%. So that's what that was. Yeah. Uh, well, Amy, it's all a bit mind-boggling, isn't it? But what we're going to do now is I found this radio um, interview and we're going to play that because that explains what this person's been doing. And he's written this book called The Perfect Holocaust and Who Kept It Perfect. He's talking a little bit about it. You find out a little bit more information. But you're like, I'm left with, how the hell did all this happen? You can't be making all that food and ex you know exporting tonnes out of Ireland and uh, the people are the people are crawling across the floor starving. Oh, I know. But it says the mass graves of Ireland. So they obviously were hunting and maybe killing families. And we all know yeah. that the black people were there. The Moore's family, you know, even Dave Moore, you know, um, uh, oh, what's he called? Um, Dave Murphy. You know, he's a Moore's. And um, oh, yes. You know, he's he told us the story about them. About how he, he realizes Irish family in the black Irish family, they did, they, what it was is he couldn't have been slaves because slaves weren't allowed to own land and his grandparents had owned their own home. Oh, wow. Well. So, so history wasn't what they said it was, it was something like that story. So he told us that. Oh, what's he called? Such and such Dave. Oh. oh no, I can't think of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's gone out of my brain. It's because we've been too much, doing too much potato famine. And so, actually, I thought the mist was bad enough because you could almost imagine that if this really, really cold mist or fog had come in and it had stayed there for three days, it could have killed the crop. Yes. But then the years before and the years afterwards of the crop, I don't get that. 
and then I don't get the bit about exporting. And you're going to finish now, Amy, because we're going to go on to the video. Okay, Karen. Yeah, sorry, do you want to say anything before we finish? Just more examples of how the history isn't what we thought. What do you think happened, though, Amy? That, what I said, that they were killing off the Morse families. Yes. That's I awful, that isn't it? That. It is awful. Just awful. And, and that, 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 I'm not, you know, I hate using that word, but let's just say the darker people were ruling and in the royalty. And I still don't get it why at the kings and queens level, they're all speaking English and the rest of the country speaking French. That sounds like right. we've been taken over by different people. It does. All, it does. This is all between Henry the Seventh, Henry the Eighth, Elizabeth the First. Well, in fact, before that, because I know, well, I've made videos about it that. There's this Back Street, James the First, William the, uh, oh, what was his name? Edward the Fourth, Edward the Fifth, William whatever he was the Third. There's William the Second. There's George the Third's wife. I think Queen Elizabeth was. I think Mary Queen of Scots had a son. He was as well. Uh, Mary Queen of Scots was. They're all much darker people. Yes. Well. We were supposed to actually work a bit of history out. Now I'm more like, I've got more questions now than I had before we started. Yeah, I know. It's always that way. I'm sorry, Amy. That does, it doesn't all add up. But I like listening to this person in the radio show. And we're going to listen to it now because maybe it's explaining a bit more about something that you knew nothing about. Exactly. That's right. And I think, actually, this is what Nigel had found out, isn't it? Yes, but it's a bit hard to know whether it's the truth or not. Uh, right, we can never know if it's the truth. I tell truth. you what, if I starve you, you're really going to spend all that time doing all the crops for me, aren't you? I know. So, so something else up. has happened. It must have been the Moors that did all this. Like, it was all their crops and everything. I, I just don't know. I know, I don't either. What, were they systematically going through Ireland and then killing the families off? Let's take all their crops and... I don't know. Anyway, we're going on to the to the to the radio show now, which will probably end up sounding like us. Look, I've, I've got even more questions after the radio show. Exactly. Yep. Amy, thank That's you so right. much for your time. Look, last word with you. You're thank welcome. you very much, my darling. Anything you want to add? No, I just think the radio show is very uh, great to listen to. So hope everyone enjoys it. Thank you, my darling. You're thank you, chat room. Oh. <laughs> You're listening to dialectradio.co.uk, your local community radio run by volunteers. Log on to our website at dialectradio.co.uk to find out more. My name is Chris Bogarty. I was born in Chicago of Irish immigrant parents. Uh, I returned to Ireland after the Second World War, 1946, and bought a little farm in County Roscommon, where I lived there for the next eight years. My father eventually uh, lived out the rest of his life and died there. Uh, oddly, oddly, uh, to say that when he died in the year 2000, my father could truthfully say his father was born 161 years ago. That was before... So that was quite of a long, his father was 65 when he was born, and my father lived to be 97 year. Uh, so I came to the States, was a house builder, became a civil engineer, worked throughout Central and South America, and also Borneo, was addressed to the U.S. Army, served in the, in the occupation army of France. Uh, Quite, my wife and I have done a great deal of anti-war efforts. We're, we've been a, a very, very busy and have run into quite a bit of difficulty, partly because of, uh, of this camp that I first made of the mass graves of Ireland and got maybe 900,000 copies out there. Now, look, I mean, most people have heard about the famines uh, around the mid uh, 19th century, 1845, 1850. But what you're saying is that actually the there are mass graves. Is that true? Yes, Ireland is dotted with mass graves. They're typically about a mile and a half apart. Uh, but my my book has a map 
that shows the location of 180 of the larger mass graves. There are typically a few thousand to each of the each of the 180 uh, mass graves that I point out. Uh, now, your book. I mean, you you talk about the Irish Holocaust. What's the title of your book? The title of the book is Ireland, 1845-1850, the perfect Holocaust. And who kept it both perfect? Unquote. Okay. Uh, now, it's, it, this is this is a very strong word to use, Holocaust, because people will say, "Well, you're uh, you're comparing it with the Nazi Holocaust." How, how many people died? Uh, about five point two million. The author of of the chapter six of the book is a man in England who has done quite a bit of extensive work, and. He says that there's more likely something close to six million uh, who were murdered in those years. Now you say murdered. Uh, you, you you say murdered, yes. but um, what we hear is that actually it was uh, the failure of the potato crop due to blight. That, that's what we all believe. That's what I believed uh, until I was middle aged. That's what we were all taught in school on both sides of the Atlantic. That's what we were taught: potato famine. But while doing my grandfather's biography, I found that the regiment that he joined, the 40th of foot, the Duke of Somerset, was, owned, was uh, had removed the food from South County Galway during the so-called famine. That shocked me because I had always believed it was what it, we were told, that it was a famine. So I researched further, and I found that more than half the British Army had been deployed into Ireland in those years, and their only task, their only function in Ireland was removing the abundant food crops from Ireland. So why was that? Why were they doing that? That's something I do not know. All I know are the basic facts, which regiment entered what area and what, what date they departed it. Well, first of all, the date they arrived into Ireland and the date they departed Ireland and the date they moved around while in Ireland. All of that is in my book. And also, the volume of food that they removed to the ports for export. And, now, the, and the escort ships that, that, that escorted the ships to wherever they went. And the Coast Guard that guarded the coast of Ireland from anyone who would interfere with the food removal. And the uh, what else? So the soldiers were the soldiers were actually there to protect the food. In other words, that there was a possibility that Irish people might try and steal that food. Yes, they, it was, there was there was no army of English harvesters working in Ireland. All those crops were created by, sown by, weeded and and, and grown by the Irish and harvested by the Irish. But at that time, Ireland was run by English landlords in Ireland. All of the land, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, 97% of the land of Ireland land was owned by English landlords. Uh, they were all later. They were all moved out. They were all bought out by the by the British government, and their land was distributed to the Irish people. The land of Ireland now is among Europe's best distributed. But until 1900 to 1920, in those years, those years are the years in which the English landlords were moved out of Ireland and back to England. While they were there, the genocide continued. The eviction, the destruction of the Irish continued as long as those landlords were in Ireland. Around about the same time, you've got uh, a lot of Irish migration to North America, haven't you? I, I imagine that's not a coincidence. Yeah. Immigration to North America has been going on for a very long time before that, uh, before and after the U.S. Revolution of 1776. A lot of food was sent over, and a huge amount of money was sent over to pay the rent to the, to, to the families of the Irish, to their English landlords at the time. The, the, the rent payment for the use of land in Ireland was typically more than what could be earned off the land. And it, it's a shocking piece of work. Uh, by the way, it's also important to say that 
a certain percentage, a large minority percentage of those British regiments in Ireland were Irish soldiers. So there, there, are, there are bloody heads also uh, to be shared among the Irish. Uh, my, my own grandfather uh, helped the British to do to the Waris in New Zealand and the Aborigines in Australia and to the Indians in, in the Indian subcontinent, the Bangladeshis and others, what had been done to his own parents in Ireland. Lord Ashbrook of Castle Ashbrook, okay, of Castle Duro in, in Duro County Leash, Lord Ashbrook, uh, he evicted my great grandparents and my granduncles and granddad in 1836 before my grandfather was born. My grandfather was born in the shadow of Lord Ashbrook Gallows on Gallows Hill, uphill of the gate to the castle of Castle in Castle Doro County Beach. Uh, that, that, that was the seventh uh, Lord Ashbrook at the time, the fifth, sixth, and seventh at the time. The current uh, Lord Ashbrook, uh, 11th, is living in Parley Hall, Cheshire, England today. So they, 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 they keep going. I don't know how he's earning his money, but he has a, a multi-thousand acre of state yet in Cheshire. The current Lord Ashbrook. I mean, the, the, what you're describing, the nearly six million Irish that died in this, what isn't really you're describing not as a famine, but as a deliberate starvation, uh, what was the purpose? Yes, I'm going to ask you again, what was the purpose of starving all these people? Well, I don't know the purpose, but one spokesman for the British government said, with a certain uh, degree of satisfaction, obviously, the way it's written, that the Celts will soon be as scarce on the banks of the Shannon, the Shannon River, as the Red Man is on the banks of the Manhattan. Okay, so they're, they're talking about really comparing the uh, Irish people to the Red Indians and the Native Americans. Yes, it, it, was, it was intended to be a complete wipeout, evidently. Um, what about the Irish government? What have they been doing about this history? Because uh, uh, have they acknowledged the truth of the mass graves, for example? Yes. It, 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 it's shocking. I wish, in a, in a certain sense, that I had died before I learned this. It's, it's, um, it's, it, it, it puts one into a permanent grief. It's, it's a little bit like the concern so many of us have for the Palestinians. Uh, it's it's a constant sense of grief of, of of mourning, and maybe particularly because the people when they were murdered they were first murdered, and then they were slandered in death for the next hundred and seventy years. That's unbearable to me. That's why when my wife and I put up a memorial over one of those mass graves, we feel a tremendous relief. What about the Irish government? What are they doing? The Irish government are the main opponents to what we're doing. Uh, they slur us. They slander us. Also, now they would like to get. They would like to imprison us. They would like to get us into trouble. The RTE, Radio Television, the state monopoly of broadcasting in Ireland. I was interviewed by uh, their the most popular. It's my understanding. The most popular radio announcer in interview in, in Ireland, Joe Duffy, on on Radio 1 of RTE Ireland. And he he accused me of putting a memorial up over a mass grave. He, he, he set me up for ridicule and questioned whether I had the right to do it, even though the local people were the ones who were asking me, but they're too afraid to do so. Uh, the people in RD outside, he was referring to one mass grave he, uh, headstone in particular in in uh, Smarmore, R.D., County Louth. And the people of R.D. had been going there on pilgrimages for the last 170 years, um, most of them Catholics, I suppose, because they would go there to say prayers for the souls of those who were murdered and buried there. And in a mass grave that no one ever marked as a mass grave, though it takes up the northern half of the cemetery. The entire northern half is taken up by people who were buried and cartloads from the workhouse in our Dini County Laos. So how did these and people so, die? I mean, were, did these people just simply die of famine, or were some of them deliberately killed? Uh, 
very, very, very few were murdered in the sense of being shot through the heart or bayoneted or something. There was, there was some of that, but very little. The, they were mostly all uh, died of starvation or of the diseases attendant upon malnutrition. When the food was removed, they soon became hungry and everything then went bad for Okay, and over hunger. the space of five years or so, uh, how many people are buried in the typical mass grave? And were the mass graves open for several years or for periods of time? They're, they're there. They're generally uh, grow, overgrown, typically with no marker of any kind. Uh, some, some do. Some have markers, but the markers tend to be, they say, typically the famine grave famine grave and of the of the six memorials that my wife and i have put up only one of them uh had ever any kind of a mark on it a marker on it of the of, of the people there uh, and yet people, everyone knows where these mass graves are they still whisper about them but they don't tell their children much of it it, it all comes by it's very very so to vote you to keep their it, it's very uh Sub Rosa. They don't mention it much, they, and yet we all learn about it in time. But the mass graves are there. The, the local people all know where their own mass grave is. And the, uh, and the Irish government is absolutely opposed to anyone learning about them. What, why is that? Um, I, 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 I find it hard to believe. I do not understand. Ireland must be the only nation on earth, the only one I've ever heard of, that conceal the genocide of their own people. I don't get it. I don't. I do not understand it. I mean, is it because this is a bit of his- history which is too difficult to deal with? No, I'm afraid it's more. It's more vicious than that. I'm afraid that they are either being blackmailed or or bribed into acquiescence. How many graves are there again? Where are they? And how many people buried? Um, my map shows the location, the precise locations of 180 of them. They're scattered throughout the country. Um, but they're, according to, the, of the six mass graves that my wife and I put up, only one of them, only one of those mass graves shows on my map. They were brought to my attention later. So I, I'm thinking that there are probably about 3,000 mass graves in what can be called mass graves in Ireland. And so what, what, source, what source material have you used to, um, to get your facts? Uh, mostly coming from people uh, who, well, the, the first one came, uh, came, came to me to ask me if, if a certain pamphlet was mine. And I said, yes, well, he said, there's something I want to show you. This is in Ballymo, uh, County Galway. So I, I visited him the next day, and he showed me a mass grave that his father and gang had found in 1910 when they were putting up fences to divide the land from the old English landlord to the Irish recipients. And he he uh, he, he brought me to the to the mass grave. It was he, he didn't have the exact spot. The finally the exact spot was determined by the owner of the land, who's who who had to they they never. Plowed that land after the first year there when they when it was given back to the Irish, and and he hit bodies. He he, he hit a mass of bodies, uh, uh, tilling plowing the, the the land nearest to his bog. He never plowed. He, there were so many bodies that he stopped to plow. Never plowed that field again. That's one mass grave, and we put up a memorial over it. Well, first of all, we put it up over where the entire village had been wiped out, where the village once stood. And then the following year, we learned the precise location from the children of the owner who who had to stop plowing because because the mass grave was in a specific location in a certain field. That field was left unplowed ever since, and has never been plowed to this day. So, has there um, ever been a map? There. Has there ever been a map uh, made of where these map, mass graves were? And have you discovered uh, any maps that were made at the time? No. No, there are no no maps. They were they were buried, and and the, the people who buried them, many were, were hoped that the people would never remember. They were they were all uh, Catholic Irish, 
but they were typically buried outside consecrated ground, outside the wall of the local cemetery. They were not considered to have uh, a, a, a future life. There was no eternal life for them. They had no souls, according to their own uh, uh, people in control of the situation. They, again, they were not given Christian burials. They were buried in dumps. They were dumped in pits outside the, outside the consecrated ground, outside the wall of the so-called holy ground. Okay, and how many, sir, and how many of these mass graves have you been able to confirm exist? Uh, you mean how many have we, have we been able to monument? How, how many have you managed to confirm that there is a mass grave there? Oh, uh, well, the 180 on the map and another seven, the 187. And then in my book, I've, as people come to me and, and point out the areas, they typically have the name like Pauper's, Pauper's Ground. They all know what they are. They call them salmon graves. So I might have another 30 in my book that I've added that are not on the map. So maybe... Maybe maybe two hundred and ten. Tell us about your book and where people can find out more about this. It, again, the title of the book is Irish Hol- uh, uh, Ireland, eighteen forty five, eighteen fifty, the perfect Holocaust, and who kept it quote perfect unquote. Uh, it's available in Ireland uh, from a John Robinson. I can give you his telephone number. Uh, um, I'll have to dig it up. Uh, or he could be emailed. Maybe better yet, he can be emailed at at um, one second now. I must say, I'm determined because all of the so-called famine writers all work for a profit. Uh, I am determined that I will make no profit from this book. Um, my wife and I were have been putting up mass grave memorials since before I even thought of doing a book. I thought my pamphlets would silence the liars, but it didn't. So then I went to when the internet came out, I put it on the internet, and uh, and I thought the internet would silence them. It did force the the salmon writers to abandon about ninety percent of their lies, but they've had to adopt a new lie to accommodate the the tremendous volume of food that was being shipped out of Ireland at the time. That can no longer be denied. I mean, give us so give us an idea of how much food was being shipped out at the time. Well, I'll go to I'll go to my book and and just take a second to to to, to dig it out. Uh, one second, please. I, I, I also have which 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 regiment was where at, at which time. Um, uh, one second now. I just want the quantity of food because that gives people an idea of how much food was leaving the country. Yes, yes. What I, what I've used for that is uh, just three. I only there's the, the, the British papers are full of it at the time. You see, there's no need to to dwell on it too much. Um, here's one sample. On July 28, 1848, when perhaps half of the Holocaust victims had already expired, the Limerick Intelligencer, a reporter of shipping news, recorded a typical day's food shipments from only the following four ports. From Limerick, the Anne, John Guise, and Messenger for London, the Pelton, the Pelton Clinton for Liverpool, and the city of Limerick, British Queen, and Cambrian Maid for Glasgow. This one day she, removal of Limerick food was of 863 firkins of butter, 212 firkins, 1,198 casks, and 200 kegs of lard, 87 casks of ham, 267 bales of bacon, 52 barrels of pork, 45 tons, and 628 barrels of flour, 4,975 barrels of oats, and 1,000 of pork barrels of flour, 4,975 barrels of 258 boxes of butter, 8,665 barrels, 571 sacks, and 225 quarters of wheat, 1,960 sacks of flour, 61 tons weight, and 700 quarters, a quarter to a quarter ton of oats, 922 sacks, and 735 other packages of oatmeal. It goes down and on. Can you give us a uh, an idea of what your experience was actually in Ireland putting a memorial on these uh, mass graves? Yes. 
the, the local people are, are very relieved. They have been coming to me to see if I could do something that they are afraid to do. Uh, once we put up the first one, that's called four other people came to us. In fact, they were in attendance at that consecration inauguration outside Ballymore County Galway when we put up the first one. Uh, again, groups from four other mass grave locations, they begged us to try and do the same thing for their mass grave. That it took me until last year, last year to get to, to get one of them done. And two of them were completely blocked from me. The people became terrorized and they gave, completely gave up any further uh, uh, drive to do it. They were have been intimidated by by their, quote, betters, unquote. There's a, a pecking order in Ireland that's really pathetic. And the people have learned that they had better obey the local norms. And the local norms are set by... The Anglo-Irish okay, I don't think that's just I don't think that's just in Ireland that that pecking order exists. Anyway, look, if people are interested in following this and maybe supporting your work, how can they get in touch, Chris? How can they get in touch with us? Um, well, they, they can. Quite a few hundreds, maybe two thousand people now or more, have copies of the book. Uh, they're contacting me and they're they're lending the book to others, and so that's one way of doing it. I had a website up for. I, irishholocaust.org for since about I mean, over 20 years I think it was just taken down last week it just disappeared I don't know why um, I, uh, it's just one of those mysteries I don't understand it was up and we're doing fine work and I thought uh, it didn't complete the job of silencing the famine writing industry and that's why I wrote the book and I'm hoping that the book will do what the pamphlet and the and the website did not quite accomplish, didn't quite manage it. But so, can you just tell us are, where where we can get copies of the book? You were you were looking up some details, uh, phone number and email. Here's the email address: John Robinson, all one word, at ircom. That's e i r c o m dot com. John Robinson at ircom dot com. And he'll uh, he'll send you whoever's interested in the book. I've donated uh, all the books printed in Ireland. I've donated to a group who are doing some pretty good work. They're trying to uh, get the Irish people to understand that there was a, a free Irish government that was set up after the 1918 elections uh, by the elected officials, and uh, they found they founded the All Ireland on January 21. Uh, 1919, after the 1918 elections, but King George V declared it an illegal assembly and set about imprisoning and shooting the elected uh, members of the government. And then on December 6, 1921, the British government imposed its own government on Ireland, and all subsequent governments of Ireland had been successors to the one that was imposed by Churchill, actually, Churchill and King George V. So it's sort of a sad story. That explains a lot. There's an awful lot about Ireland that I found hard to understand. Um, when living here in Chicago, where I am, I was up from South America, and I, I asked our uh, Irish Consul General, uh, shouldn't we be doing something about the Birmingham Six that they had been tortured into confessing to a bombing in Birmingham? And they were obviously innocent. And that should we be doing something for them? He said, oh, no, terrorism, terrorism, oh, no, terrorism. So we didn't do anything. And then we, it was nearly 10 years later, we got interested again. We would no longer pay any attention to him. And he played a small role in freeing them. Uh, by, by locking up those Birmingham Six, the British government kept the actual killers, the actual bombers, uh, at large. You wonder why they would do that. But they, that's, that's what happened to them and the Guildford Four. The movie, there was a film made of the Guildford Four uh, in the name of the father. Same kind of thing. Um, but there's, there's a simpler one that has not been exposed at all yet. And that is the, the August 15th, 1998 bombing by MI5 and the Chicago FBI agent, along with a lifelong criminal, who moved 
from Chicago to Ireland in 1994 and remained there until mission accomplished for MI5. And that was the bombing murder of 29 people in Oma County, Tyrone. The, it was an IRA bomb, but it was the, the bomb car was owned by an Irish government uh, agent. And they were all working with the Chicago FBI and MI5, and they managed to to turn that IRA bomb into an atrocity. There had been five previous IRA bombs in which nobody at all got hurt, but there was there was property damage done, for which the British government, the Exchequer, was paying. So the, with the with the help of MI5 and the uh, Chicago FBI. They managed to turn that into an atrocity, and that defeated the IRA. The British Army did not defeat the IRA, but MI5 and the Chicago FBI did. They defeated the FBI. The Good Friday Agreement was driven home, which surrendered the six disputed counties to the British government. It is now an undisputed British province, and that ended that. So the, the, the pretty much the same conditions continue in the six counties for the, the, the native Irish kind of living there. Interesting take on the Good Friday Agreement. Anyway, okay, Chris, uh, thanks very much.